Um, allow me to make a few introductions. My name is Tim Morrison, and um, I am the Minister of Music at Custer Road United Methodist Church. And in about a week, I will be celebrating my 35th year with this family here at this church, and um, I am truly blessed by it. Um, but um, I recognize that we are in a chaotic time in terms of COVID. I was mentioning um, in some emails with the bishop and asking questions about how he felt that singing would be affected in the church, and I got a great deal of encouragement with him about this moment right here, that he recommended that we get together as people who are interested in trying to do what's best for people for the physical health and their emotional health, as well as, of course, their spiritual health, and to keep that all in balance. So um, you and your various congregations have been given a wonderful and mighty task, and that is trying to interpret the things that we are learning from the choral and scientific community and trying to figure out what does that mean for your people. And so um, blessings upon you as you seek for that discernment. Um, the purpose, I, I, I hope, is obvious. The purpose today is to glean from some of this stuff that we've heard from ACDA and other organizations and other people that are putting out information about the effects of singing and the potential spread of the coronavirus. And we're trying to keep that in balance with what it means to be in worship and um, uh, now and then in the future. So for your information today, we will be dealing with four questions. And the four established questions are basically these in a little bit of summary. The first question is, um, what is your understanding of the information that's been shared with us from ACDA? And then uh, the second question is going to be, what have you been doing since that outbreak in terms of, since that moment, what have you been doing to um, share this with your congregations? What have you been doing in the quarantine worship situation? And then talking about pastoral care and how we are dealing with people emotionally and spiritually. And then finally, um, what are we going to be doing when we get back together? I need to introduce you to a few people. First of all, Tracy Everson, she is on with us. She is going to be our administrative assistant today. She's going to be making sure that we can hear the ones that we can hear and that we don't hear those of you that we can't really hear at this moment. Um, she's going to administrate us. And then in addition, I want to introduce you to the panel. Um, they represent all of the four districts within our conference. They do represent also the United Methodist Church. Um, some of them have been working for a long time, and as they answer questions, I'm going to ask them to give more details about who they are. Um, uh, Dr. Jason Bishop, he is at Christ United Methodist Church Plano. Dr. Brock Johnson, he is at Wesley in Greenville. Manya Logan at St. Luke in Dallas. Mike Lightfoot, First Richardson. Um, Karen Kraska at Treach over there in Flower Mound area, and Kristen Gossett, who is at First Wichita Falls, Dana Effler at First Dallas, and Taylor Davis at St. Andrew. That's the team of folks who I have asked to impart their wisdom. If you have questions which are not being lifted up in this context, please feel free to add that to the chat area. That's your little button right there at the bottom of the screen, and you can add any specific questions that you would like to ask as we go along. And then good old Tracy, she's going to help me keep track of those and make sure we address the ones that are lifted up in that capacity. Okay, so um, first of all, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Wonderful and awesome God, I pray for your wisdom and discernment upon us as we try to make sense of what we're learning about this great gift in the voice and how you would ask us to be leaders um, chorally and congregational singing for the churches in which we serve. So bless us, dear Lord, with your discernment and your wisdom um, as we glean from each other's experience and creativity. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. Now let's begin. I'm going to start with you, Brother Taylor, if you would please unmute yourself. Um, Taylor, please talk about how long you have been serving St. Andrew. And I would ask you, sir, if you would kind of go ahead and address and summarize as best you can, trying to not assume that everyone has heard. Um, what's the information we're receiving from ACDA and others about the effect of the voice singing and corona? Sure. Taylor? So um, my name is Taylor. I've been at... Uh... St. Andrew in Plano for, I'm in my fifth year right now, which is- uh, Taylor, I'm believe. not hearing you, bud. I, I see, I don't think that you're muted. Are the rest of you hearing Taylor? Thumbs up or thumbs down? You Got can it. hear me? Right. Continue, okay. Taylor. Great. Um, so I'm in my fifth year at St. Andrew in Plano, uh, and I've been in North Texas since 2011 when I was at, uh, originally at First Methodist in Fort Worth. Uh, I'm gonna share a link with everybody uh, in the event that you have not seen 
the ACDA um, summary. It's not an official summary, so um, and I don't know that ACDA has put one out, but it is a nice uh, uh, capture of everything that was said. If you haven't seen the video, uh, there are parts of it that are sobering. There are parts of it that are maybe um, hyper conservative and feel a little um, maybe not blown out of proportion, but could be taken as such. There are certainly parts that could be packaged as sleep aid uh, and sent uh, out into your local pharmacy. It's just a little dry. Uh, and so as such, I, I have not, I mean, I've shared the, the link to the video with uh, our pastors at St. Andrew, but mostly I've just driven them to the uh, link that I shared with you because it just uh, takes everything and distills it. So if you click on that, you'll see that there are some major bullet points, um, essentially saying that there's no space solution to eliminate the risk uh, as we know it right now. And to put that in perspective, in order for the Westminster Choir to do their thing, we would need to put them in a football stadium in order to have them spaced appropriately. Uh, from what we know right now, masks are not um, a safe method of singing or don't mitigate the risks of singing. Um, singing being something between speaking loudly and sneezing as far as the release of aerosols. Um, with rapid testing, uh, which is not even immediately available, um, we still don't uh, feel confident. Um, and we are probably a ways away from a vaccine. Uh, so essentially the ACDA um, report just goes on to say that we don't know enough right now to say that singing um, should be a thing for us. And um, when I initially sent this out to our pastors, uh, some questions were raised about congregational singing. Um, and I was just very quick to point out that it ACDA nor Nats, who, who joined in on this, uh, said anything about what kind of singing. It's not limited to classical singing. It's not limited to traditional music. It's all singing as we know it right now. Um, and additionally, some questions have been raised, I've seen in various other forums about humming and what that possibility is. And I don't think anybody has studied that because when in the history of church music have we ever been about humming? Um, so uh, basically everything that we have known is up in the air. Um, I will say that somewhere uh, out there is a study from uh, Germany that is a little more promising. And yet if you went halfway down the middle and uh, took the more promising study and merged it with the ACDA study and just went 50% of the way, um, we still don't know enough to say what is safe, what isn't, and um, putting our choirs, congregations at risk seems to be um, something that uh, we should take into consideration when deciding what we're going to do when we, quote, come back. So I hope you'll click on the link. It's incredibly informative and distilled uh, in a way that I think most people, uh, even those who have not studied the voice uh, tremendously, would benefit from. Tim, does that sum it up for you? Yeah, thank you very, very much, Taylor. And of course, we're not looking for some kind of definitive answer. We're just looking on information. I really appreciate you sharing that link that everyone can go and see that for themselves. Um, I'd like to get an additional perspective on the findings. Um, Dr. Brock Johnson, if you would unmute yourself. I haven't looked around to see if you are there as of yet. Um, Brock is also a professor of voice at Texas A&M Commerce. Brock, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, Brock, I know that you've also involved with some committee work and even in terms of teaching and the voice. What would you add to what Taylor had to say in terms of what you've been learning? You pretty much said it all. I mean, there's really no safe answer yet to all of this. But the things that are being pursued right now is the space in which the singing happens or the number of singers in a space and also the time that the singers are singing. So if you have a large space with very few singers, for a short amount of time, there's a lot less risk than if you have a fuller choir in the space for a longer period of time. So if you just go in, like sing one song and run out the door and suck in the fresh air, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
That's a technical word, suck in a fresh air. That's awesome, Brock. Thank you. Um, I look to hear from both of you, even as we continue to some of the answers of some of the other questions that are coming up. I'm very interested in what you're doing in both of your congregations. But let's now move on um, after we've kind of set the table and we kind of have an understanding of what is um, before us. Let's figure out what some people have been doing up to this point. So since the word came out and since we have been quarantined, I know that many of you are doing some very creative things in terms of how to, to um, lead in music and, and worship. And so I would like to uh, go first to Manya Logan. Manda, Manya, I wish um, that you would share with us some of the stuff that you have been doing with both your choir and your church, and please include some of the viral stuff that you've been doing, some of the spacing issues you've been doing with your singing um, in your worship services. Manya, would you please unmute and share with us? Good afternoon. I am Manya, and I serve at St. Luke Community United Methodist Church. And on tomorrow, I will celebrate my 29th anniversary. So it's like, okay. So um, some of the things we're doing, I usually use four singers. I, that's all that our uh, stage can accommodate. And we try to at least be six feet apart. Um, at the be very beginning, we used to hold the mics and now we put the mics on the stand. So therefore they're singing directly into the mic and singing forward. Um, We've done that every Sunday since March 15th. I had, had the four singers. And then uh, two Sundays ago, we premiered our first virtual choir uh, with about nine women. It was our women's ensemble. And then today we premiered our uh, SATB choir with 24 singers. Um, so everybody was excited about it. It's a lot of work, let me say, uh, to do the virtual choir because I have to have an editor who goes in and edits the video and also with the audio. And so um, she's using the Adobe Premiere for editing the video. And also there's an audio component in Adobe, but we also use Audacity to uh, just kind of clean up the audio. Uh, audio too, and then put it together. Um, the challenging part for us, first we have the band to record the track. Then I sing each part um, for the choir members. Then I email it out, ask them to, they have to have two devices, uh, a computer and a phone. They can choose which one they're gonna record on, but they listen to me sing it and they sing with me but they are recording and all I want to hear is their voice uh, and they're recording um, what um, they're singing. And then um, we send it to um, my editor and then she puts this together. Um, we have to tell them uh, to count one, two, three, so we can make sure we can line it up and um, give them a, what we call a, a song map of telling them you know, how long the intro is. Uh, and then how many times you would sing this part and things like that. And so far, uh, it has worked well. For some people, it has been a little challenging just because um, a lot of them did not use their camera to actually do videoing. And so, um, but they're doing, you know, they're doing well with it now. And so every Sunday, uh, we meet and just talk about uh, our next song that we're going to be doing. And um, then we send it out and ask them to return it to us. Um, at a, you know, they get a deadline, they return it at that deadline, and then um, we will share it on Sunday morning. Uh, in interestingly enough, the congregation asked about whether or not they could sing virtually. And so uh, my next project is actually to send out a hymn and then just invite the congregation to uh, either send, send an audio, and if they send an audio, just send a picture, but actually to video themselves singing uh, the hymn. And then we will have the congregation singing virtually. Manya, I, I wanna say thank you so much. And I've heard the choir that, you know, with the, the women's group that you um, sent to me, and I thought it was just awesome. Manya, I'm gonna say something. I please hope that you and your sweet ladies are not offended. Um, <laughs> I was noticing that the potential age of some of your participants in the choir 
um, were um, of a state where I would thought, oh my goodness, good for you for giving it a shot. So I just want to disarm everyone in terms of some of the people that you had that, that came along with the technology and were not overwhelmed by it. And I think that's important for even the smallest churches among us on this chat, on this video right here, to recognize that there is some technology which is available. Manya, we're doing the same thing as you, and I'm trying to put my first one out this week. And um, right. I know it's a big deal, especially the editing part, but I really want to disarm how complicated it is and our people's ability to do it. Do you have anything else you want to add to that virtual experience? Um, not, uh, I mean, I, I would like to say one Sunday, we actually had a um, guest saxophonist. And so actually, uh, we had him to well, virtually, he actually worshiped with us uh, through a video. And so I'm just, any way I can get the music um, to the congregation and, you know, in our worship experience, we're doing it. Cool. And I know during the week, I also sent a song to the choir. So, you know, just keeping us engaged. So. Okay. Thank you, Manya, very much. Cool. Let's get Let's get some more ideas. Mike Lightfoot at First Richardson. Um, and Mike, I, I kind of want to put you on the spot, and I'd like to, for you to talk about what it is that you have been doing in terms of chorally, um, but if you can also kind of lean across the desk um, and, and talk about what your contemporary groups are doing as well. I know that there are some folks on this, this web um, who would like to hear that answer. Mike? Thanks, Jim. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Lightfoot. I'm director of music at First United Methodist Church Richardson. Of, of course, we're continuing to provide worship music every week. Uh, we began by doing live services at the very beginning of this, and then we discovered we could do a much cleaner service if it was all pre-recorded. So now I'm going in on Tuesday afternoons, and, and we're recording the music on Tuesdays, and the sermons are recorded on Thursdays, and we're able to, it's, it's very much a streamlined service now. They're doing a great job with that. And by doing that, we're able to sing four weeks of hymns in one session. We work a lot of hymns up and we're able to pre-record those. And the same with, with anthems. And I've been using soloists and, and quartets, and I even had a, a sextet this last week. That's as large as we've gone with those live recordings. Uh, but uh, Manya, we have also done the virtual. I was never going to do a virtual video. Uh, I said, I don't ever want to get into that. That just seems like too much. I asked one of my singers if he would sing that uh, one Sunday several weeks ago, and he said he's staying at home, but he would love to produce a virtual. I thought this is our chance. So uh, I'll let, you, you know, Eric Tchaikovsky, Tim. Yes, sir. And, uh, I let Eric get his hands into that, and he is amazing. And this turned out so well. We had 14 singers on that. We now have uh, three virtual videos being done as we speak. We're, those will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And uh, the instrumental virtual videos, I, I think, are a bit easier. Mary can lay down the piano, send it off, and her combo adds their instrumental parts, and it's done. Vocally, a little more uh, time consuming. And we too are doing a 24 voice ensemble and I've even got a staff ensemble. We have some of our pastors participating uh, and, and the music team and some of the modern worship. And that's one thing that we've got, Tim. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to combine children, youth, uh, chancel choir and modern worship all together. We couldn't, we couldn't have done things like that because we're generally worshiping at the same time as modern worship. So we're now uh, Eric is, is able to, we're, we're creating things where we have modern worship and, and our traditional worship going together and, and creating things. And that's, that's a unique experience. I think uh, we've talked about our online worship. Uh, Clayton mentioned that it's probably 10 years ahead of where it should be. This is where we dreamed we would be uh, in 10 years, and now we are forced to be there. Not an ideal situation. Uh, we're, we're missing all of the, the gatherings, the large gatherings of the choirs and the choral singing and all that goes with that choir family. But uh, making, making a good situation out of this, I think we're, we're really learning a lot through this. Uh, again, Eric Tchaikovsky with the Modern Worship, they're producing videos every week, and 
and they they have they've been down this road before, so it's not a new game to them. So it, the learning curve was not as great for them, but they're doing a wonderful job with that, and and their their services again are very streamlined. Okay, so um, Mike, in particular, in terms of the things you've been doing, I kind of want to ask you, but also it open to any of the panel that's out there. Uh, Mike, you and, and Manya and I are, are, are blessed with some AV teams that really can provide a lot of stuff for us. Can you use some imagination about some places that are maybe doing Facebook Live or they don't have the access to the same kinds of people that have the technological um, input that we do? Can anyone give us some input in terms of how you are singing uh, without all the forces of being able to do virtual choirs? I'll open that up and if no one um, jumps in, I'll go ahead and pick on a few folks. Anybody want to jump in? Okay, Brock, you're picked on. Um, so, uh, Bro Dr. Brock Johnson, um, in particular, um, I know you, you know you at Wesley, you got all that kind of cool stuff going on there. In spite of doing some pre-recorded stuff, which I know you're doing recently, but um, prior to that, you were doing stuff in the moment. Like, how many singers were you using? You had like a quartet or four folks that were up front, and you were doing your hymns like at once, and that was on a Sunday morning. How have you been living into this recently? Well, recently we've been making recordings of them. We've never had any of the choir members as well. I've had like one person who plays the piano and sings to do an anthem. Um, that's been something new. And I've been thinking as we've talking about the easy things to do virtual choirs. There's an app called Aca or, or, Acapella, I believe. And so you can have one um, piano accompaniment recorded and you can put that in a nine or 12 square kind of thing. You could, and then you can send it to each person who wants to, to do that. All they have to do is plug their phone in and then sing to what they hear. And then it eliminates the whole um, Adobe Pro of um, organizing a virtual choir in that sense. So I don't know if anyone else has experimented with that. I see some head shakes. Okay. Rusty has. <laughs> Thank you, Brock. Um, and now then I would like to go back to Taylor. Taylor, we have been thinking mostly in terms or discussing mostly in terms of worship, but we've been having to do things in terms of Wednesday nights. And I know you and I have kind of even had a little bit of a conversation about um, how are you dealing with your people in terms of Zoom or other technology? What have you been doing up to this point to continue a, a music teaching or inspiration? I, I'll admit that um, I probably very foolishly kept thinking, well, I'm not going to dig too deep into what I can do virtually because surely this is going to relent at some point. Mm. I sort of found myself in this um, state of paralysis where I, I kept waiting for the good news to come and, uh, and that I'm not sure when that broke. It hasn't been that long. Um, so I, I jotted down all these things uh, a couple weeks ago that we could start doing and we're, we're beginning some. I this whole time have been keeping up with the choir doing joys and concerns uh, for a while, a uh, few days a week, I was sending recordings, uh, YouTube recordings of just various pieces of really great choral literature, stuff that we've maybe done, stuff that we were gonna do, stuff that's just well beyond um, what, what we would do in any normal setting uh, with kind of a devotional attached to it. And people have really loved that when uh, on the other side of my realization that this isn't going away anytime soon, uh, I began thinking about how we could connect. So one of my, um, one of the things I'm working on right now is just a, a series of getting to know you emails. And, um, and so the first one is going to be taking the 14 married couples who sing in the choir together and talking about their story and how it centers perhaps around the fact that they sing together. So they're sending me um, their wedding photos and the song that maybe they dance to or that captures their dating. And then we're sending out uh, just that blurb and maybe a link to that song. Uh, but hopefully, and maybe more importantly, why they continue the, the Wednesday night, you know, rehearsal, uh, the Sunday morning rhythm um, when it returns. So just some getting to know you stuff in, that otherwise I, I would never have thought, oh, I should point out that we have 14 married couples singing in the choir. Um, 
So I think just being really strategic about using this, this moment where nobody has anything better to do than learn about these 14 couples. Um, but on the other side of that, I'm already formulating what, um, what it means for us to have um, music theory classes, music history classes, church music classes where people can, uh, whether this is something that we do online or something that we do in person, um, but things that we can do that are not singing related, but keep the energy and music alive um, within our congregation. And uh, that, as Mike was saying, that also maybe chip away at the idea of traditional singing versus contemporary singing and just recognizing that if no singing is happening at all, that surely there's a way for us to rally together and learn about um, various uh, things that could help us in the next time we are able to sing together. Um, so uh, I'm working on things like that in addition to these getting to know you um, platforms as well. Um, thank you, Taylor. I want to tell you that you motivated me, brother. You were talking about uh, teaching theory and some other things. So last week I, I used Zoom, you know, and I did share an attachment, which is relatively easy to do. And I showed videos of cameras going down people's throats. So they were singing. It grossed everyone out and entertained me all the more to watch their faces. <laughs> but uh, there are so many things that we can do right now in the midst of our separation, which are just right at everybody's fingertips that we can do to keep everybody connected and moving forward. Taylor, you had a nice segue, so I do want to move on to Karen Kraska right now. And Karen, um, you were the one who brought up with me, um, you know, dealing with everyone where they are emotionally and pastoral care. And Taylor talked about how we keep people connected. Would you please talk about our responsibilities as people within the church for um, their mental and spiritual health as well and, and how you see those challenges? Absolutely. I'm Karen Kraska. I serve at TREACH in Flower Mound. I've been there for, I'm in my 22nd year. And um, I, like Taylor, kept thinking, okay, this is going to end soon. This is going to end soon, but it looks like um, it's not going to end real soon. And um, so one of the things that I've seen with uh, congregants and in the choir members is a real sense of despair. When I think we were two weeks in and one of my, well, a lot of choir members said, can't we just meet in the parking lot and sing? I miss everyone, you know, those kinds of things. And as it's drug on, it's gotten worse, and especially for those that live alone, um, folks that are older that have really, really taken shelter at home and really not gone anywhere. So we've tried to uh, reach out so much. We do a weekly Zoom meeting with the choir, and I would be lying if I said we had um, overwhelming participation, but there are those that every single week are there. And um, we do share joys and concerns through email every week. Typically, we would do that on Wednesday night uh, in our choir rehearsals, in our bell rehearsals. We've had Zoom bell meetings each week as well. And uh, we do share joys and concerns on those Zoom meetings. And those that can't join for whatever reason or choose not to email our choir president, our handbell leader, and those get on the weekly emails with permission to share those. So we've continued to pray for each other and stay connected virtually uh, during this time. Karen, um, I am looking at our chat room and we have several people who have been asking questions about handbells and you were kind enough to bring them up. You know, um, it's being in close proximity with each other. Do you have any kind of um, thought to address some of the questions that we're singing about whether or not it would be safe for handbell choirs to be together? Um, that puts you on the spot, Karen, but do you have a feeling about that? We have not come together um, just because we've just now gotten back in our building and right now we're just staff in the building. Unless you're a staff member, you're not allowed in the building. And so that's been a moot point for us and doing it via Zoom would not be feasible. Very, you know, if I sat out in the parking lot and gave everybody their bell and, and sent a track, I, I don't think, I've got some folks in my bell choir that are like, I don't even wanna do the Zoom because I'm just not into the techno technology. So that for us wouldn't work. I saw some of the chatting earlier with distancing. Bells, bells are, you know, you're sharing bells and you're close in proximity. I have not tried a virtual bell choir. It sh there is a way to make it work, absolutely. With a click track and all of that, if your ringers are up to snuff, it could work. We have not done that. But we have stayed connected um, and we, we send out devotionals and the same thing that 
uh, Taylor saying videos and inspiration, inspirational, you know, memes and jokes and just trying to connect in whatever ways we can sharing, you know, sharing highs and lows and all those kinds of things have, I've, I feel like we've stayed connected, but it's not the same. Thank you, Karen. So now then, um, just a point of privilege, I recognize as I look on here that much to my surprise, my dad has joined us. He is Bob Morrison, if you see his face around there somewhere. The reason why I bring this up is because my dad and I have been talking a lot about smaller churches and what smaller churches can do in this time frame. And I'm seeing a lot of that activity that's going on over there in the chat to the side. And what I've learned about my dad, who is retired in, um, in the Missouri Conference and retired for quite some time, but has been called back to service. He has a two little point charge um, after he has been retired from being a district superintendent for a really long time. And so for my dad and my attempt to get with Bob, that's the man's name, and um, try to help him do Facebook Live and to get on there. And I have been so proud of how he has been jumping into technology, but also not afraid to sing a hymn. Um, people can sing in their homes and just not being afraid of doing whatever we can do, whatever our context is, to lead people in worship. Um, it's, it's the absence um, from being involved in people's lives that I think is what we need to try and avoid and to step in within our context and do whatever it is we can. So I hope that you two are inspired and comforted by knowing that you are perfect for whoever you are to bring a perfect message of God's love and music to whoever it is needs to hear it from you. Now, um, Kristen Gossett, I'm going to come to you right now at this point. Um, you are not at a small church out there, but you do kind of have um, at least a unique window. You, you and Brock are now being given some opportunities um, by the bishop to begin considering to open up in the near future, not saying that you are, but um, I would like for you to speak to us anything about um, what you're doing in terms of what you have been doing um, and what you see is coming down the road in the outlying districts. Kristen? Well, I, we have the email connection. We do it on Wednesdays and Sundays if anyone is missing from performance or from rehearsals. We are in constant contact and I send weekly uh, performances out of YouTube videos or past audios, uh, performances from our choir of our upcoming anthems. And I was continuing to do that when it's on a week to week basis or twice weekly where it's relevant to current events for inspiration or relevant to the sermon for the week. I have um, asked, we are a unique situation. Well, not unique, but we already were in TV ministry for over 20 years, but we have antiquated digital recording TV system. So we are recording live every Sunday morning. We are not able to splice in, we've tried to, but our equipment hopefully will be updated in the next few months, but it's not now. So we are live. I have asked different groups. I have had children that their parents have uh, said they're comfortable with their children. Um, singing. Uh, um, we've, of course, social distance. I've had small groups. I've tried to have different people within my music ministry, and everybody's just amazed. They say, well, we saw them up there week to week or in the children's choir or the youth choir. We didn't realize they could do that. Today, I had a mom and two daughters sing. And we've also had instrumental where Keo plays the organ and I play the piano and We've had professional flautists and things like that. Um, so I've just tried to be creative with anthems that had an easy instrumental part or that I can convert to two part, three part. We occasionally have done four part and we social distance. Um, what is happening June 7th is that uh, we are going to continue online well online we are going to encourage at home worship through august because in july we are going to have no air conditioning in our sanctuary and but we have told them that if they want to come on june 7th if they feel like they have to be a part of the sanctuary 
then we will have 25% only. We will have no hymnals. We will have no cushions, wooden pews. They will have to wear a mask the entire time. Uh, we won't pass anything and they will have to sanitize when they come in the building and encourage them again to wait till we can have normal, excellent worship unless they actually feel, absolutely feel like they have to be present in the sanctuary and then they will come. So, um, so that's, go ahead. Th thank you very much. You, you're again providing a good segue for us because in a minute, we're gonna to get to what I think is most of what people want to hear about. And that is, how are we going to get back together? Um, the impetus to this point has been to define the situation we find ourselves and to figure out what people are doing in this mi middle time until we get back together. Um, I have been taking a few notes from others and I wanna lift up some other creative things for you to think about just to add to the box of creativity in your thinking. Um, one, an idea that I caught from someone else, but which you enjoyed here. We had some recordings of the Chancel Choir in the past, but not good video. So we decided to take every Chancel Choir picture and to print it out on a copier and to put their pictures on their chairs in the choir loft. And then to just play the recording and then to have uh, those pictures there and kind of scan across for everyone to see the faces of the people that would have been singing. Um, this morning it was funny because there was a soloist, Chris, that we zoomed in on, then they zoomed in on the congas when that part came. It was just an interesting way of not having a bank of video from the past, but having audio and kind of doing something new with a visual thing to go along with it. Um, I really was inspired, um, Mike, by some of the things that you said about how we can combine elements. And if some of our services have become all traditional or all contemporary, we can use the talent from our children and our youth to all get together in one space. I know that next week for us, we're trying to look at how to lift up the senior class, you know, as you mentioned with the graduations that aren't happening and, and how can we lift them up and they're going to be providing some singing. I think in terms of leading the worship, I think for many of us, um, the question is boiling down to aerosol. We can do a lot in terms of singing in our churches by providing small groups up front and keeping them six feet apart from each other. But how many of us have the distance and the amount of space to keep people, you know, 30 feet apart from each other in terms of the aerosol? And so it's like, what is this, what is this that we've learned and to what extent are we going to help people be safe um, when we get back together and how that's going to look. So now I want to kind of turn, um, well, you know what? I'm gonna take a pause because maybe someone on um, the panel has more thoughts about what you're doing now that you would like to share that would be creative um, to offer for people to have before we step into what's next. Do I have anyone on the panel that would like to jump in with a creative thought that we haven't considered yet? I've got one. Go. Hey, Tim. Hi, Dana. You're next on the list. Great. Woohoo! Um, hi, everybody. I'm Dana Effler. I'm at First Methodist Dallas. Um, and I don't know if uh, we, we just have a bunch of hams or what at our church. But so when all this happened, uh, Tim and I were uh, taking a little break down in Fredericksburg. Tim, Tim as in your husband. Yeah, Tim. Oh, sorry. Not Tim Morrison. Sorry. That's I'm sure it would have been fun, Tim, but it but we you know, we yeah. thought a lot about you, but it was my husband. Uh, okay. Anyway, so I took my ukulele along, and uh, we, I had a friend of mine also with us, and I was like, what are we going to do? Because we just went on lockdown, and uh, I thought, oh, no. And so being in a little bit of a playful mood, I decided to get my friend to videotape. I was playing ukulele, if you can picture it, uh, and Tim was singing. And so we created a game of music video tag. So it was a, it was just the little fun song, you know, that Kermit sings. Uh, what is it? Uh, um, oh, Rainbow Connection. Yeah, it was Rainbow Connection, whatever. We just sang it. And then we tagged the next choir member. And then they created their video. And so I've been sending out the videos on both Remind and our Facebook page. And it's still going, y'all. We've still... <laughs> And so everybody is really interacting 
and they're excited to see the next thing. And, uh, and a lot of it kind of devolved into um, parody and spoof on COVID, you know, changing, changing words to songs, you know, to be relevant. But we've had a blast with it. And it's something that's a little lighter. You know, I think we've got a ton of heavy going on right now. We've got about all the heavy we can take. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's really been something that I think has lightened uh, the mood a little bit. So if you have a bunch of hams in your choir, uh, and also the good thing was, I found out I had some soloists I didn't knew, know I had. I was like, ooh, write that down. We're coming back to them. So anyway, that's the thing. Thank you very much, Dana. So anybody else have any other things, create any other hams out there? Tim? Yes, go, Mike. I want to brag on my uh, children's choir director, my youth choir director. They have really been thinking outside the box this entire time, uh, creating uh, videos every week, uh, keeping in touch with the kids. Uh, Ian, our youth choir director, challenged the kids to do random acts of kindness around the house and gave awards out to kids that really stepped up and did that. So he had them coming in. I've, I've cleaned the creek behind the house. I'm I'm taking the garbage out. It just went over and above. So it got the kids involved. My children's choir director does a weekly video. And uh, last week it was about the organ. So she interviewed my wife. Matter of fact, the kids from the children's choir asked the questions to Mary. And Mary took them on a journey through the organ chamber and told them all about the organ. This not only, it's, it's, there's some humor in it, but it's not only beneficial for the kids. This is really good. A lot of the adults were watching this and got so much out of it. So if you've got things behind the scenes, things that in your church that you can think of, take the kids on a journey through that. It's, it really is, is very effective. Thank you, Mike. That's awesome. We'll do that, buddy. I'll take you up on that. Anyone have anything else to add? All right, so now then let's transition between um, what has been and what might become in terms of getting down the road. I know some of us may have worship services that are going to be starting up quickly in terms of in-person. Some of us may be getting a lot of pressure for that. And I think all of us are wondering, now, what is that going to look like? And I think really um, I'm interested now in um, dealing with some of your questions over here in the chat about the use of face masks and about congregational singing. And so let's kind of dip into the what might be coming down the road, realizing that we're all in different camps. And right now I'm going to uh, jump over to uh, Dr. Jason Bishop. Where are you, Jason? And if you might just say, what are you guys talking about in terms of what might happen in your um, neck of the woods when things start opening up? Jason? Yeah, well, uh, so hi, I'm Jason Bishop, um, Director of Music uh, at Christ United Methodist in Plano. Um, I have, it's a position I have been in for just shy of six months. Um, I began in January. I had about six weeks uh, with my choir, and then they were gone. Um, and so we, we have been trying to con really continue uh, building our very new relationship with each other uh, on Zoom and through other methods, um, and so it's it's been it's it's been uh, awkward, uh, but also um, uh, it has uh, caused us to be creative. I think in uh, making sure that we prioritize, um, as all of you are talking about, ways of staying connected uh, with each other. Um, we we have been talking, of course, like all churches, I'm sure, about when we will reopen and how we will reopen and what that will look like. And I will say, for starters, that we've not set a date uh, yet for when we plan to uh, return to live worship. We're, we, we've had a lot of conversations about it. We're, we're looking at what some potential dates might be that would make sense. Um, but I will say one thing that was very helpful for us. We did a, a church-wide survey um, a couple of weeks ago and asked a number of questions of our church members on this topic. If we return, uh, you know, next month, what, uh, what are your concerns? What would you expect to see when we return to live worship? How comfortable would you personally feel uh, with returning to live worship now, uh, six months from now, et cetera? Um, we were expecting, because I think someone just mentioned um, 
pressure, uh, uh, expecting that we, there might be some pressure to, to get back to live worship as soon as possible. That really didn't bear out. Um, uh, the majority of our people, I mean, it was not, it was maybe 60% or so of the people who responded to the survey um, said that they were happy with the online offerings that we are uh, providing right now with all of the uh, time and energy and effort we're putting into that and that they uh, were happy to continue attending church virtually uh, for the time being. We did not, uh, there were a few people who said, yes, we'd like to be back as soon as possible, but it surprised us that they were in the minority. Um, and so that, I think that took a little bit of, of weight off our shoulders in a sense, not because we, we would love to be back in in-person worship as soon as possible, of course, but I think we were assuming that, um, we, we, that, that many people may want to do that before we could guarantee that it was uh, safe. And, um, and that didn't bear out in the survey results uh, anyway. So we're talking now about, we're continuing to talk about what that's going to look like. We are putting together guidelines um, for, um, uh, which have not been released uh, to our congregation yet, but they've been released to our staff. Our offices will be reopening tomorrow. Um, senior staff have been in the church um, for the last, you know, or, I mean, we've been in the church off and on the whole time, but we'll be reopening the offices to all of the staff starting tomorrow. Uh, staff will be required to wear masks uh, when they're in the offices. Um, we have, um, as we're putting together our guidelines for reopening, it's pretty clear to us that we're going to uh, include a requirement for wearing masks, um, that we're going to do pre-registration because we've measured our sanctuary and in terms of, you know, figuring out how many people can we fit in here if they are spaced six feet apart. We've literally gone through all of the pews and measured with <laughs> tape measure and, and, and markings and all of that and figured out how we can do that. So we now have an idea of how many people would fit if they were um, socially distanced. So we plan to put together a system for registering um, attendance uh, so that we know when we've met capacity. Um, we're talking about all that right now, but the, the million dollar question is we haven't decided when that's actually going to begin. Um, we're just trying to get ready for it uh, whenever, whenever it does. Um, we have decided to, in, you know, in, uh, consistent with the Bishop's recommendation of remaining online uh, at least for churches in our district in the Metroplex through June, uh, we're definitely doing that. Um, and we intend to reevaluate um, as we approach the end of June about whether or not we'll begin to phase in small groups um, in in-person worship in some way in July. So that's where we are. Cool. Thank you, Jason. Dana, I did want to come back over to you and talk about what First Dallas is looking at. And Dana, as I'm reading some of the chat, if I could throw some things into you to consider, if you can, if they're applicable. Um, I'm seeing some things over here about cleaning supplies and about how to protect musicians and about some practical things about coming back together. But you can take this anywhere you like. Go ahead, Dana. Well, I mean, I thought at first you were going to say, would you please go over and clean some churches? And I can certainly do that if you'd like. If you, um, I, I actually did read a whole article about how to clean wood pews. It's uh, So if you Google it, you can find it. But uh, anyway, so Tim, you want, you want me to talk about, uh, what do you, masks? Oh, no, just anything in terms of coming back. What has your church been deciding about? When we come back, okay. this is where we will kind of live. Do you have any of that as First Dallas has been exploring? Well, you know what? I, I don't know if any of y'all have done this. I, I've done it, and I just want to go ahead and own it. Um, when we came back from Fredericksburg, I immediately got busy with, okay, well, here's how it's going to look when we come back. And so I'm going to go ahead and get all my planning done for lessons and carols, and I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And, and just as soon as I made all those plans, I had to tear them up and throw them in the trash can right after the ACDA report came out. So I was real excited about that. Um, anything that I could say to you right now about our coming back would be purely speculation, um, because I don't know. Um, I do know that currently, like many of you, 
Um, we have a robust uh, media ministry. Um, like Jason said, uh, I've, I've surveyed my choir because I said to them, anyone who wants to sing, I'm going to make a way for you to sing. Um, and uh, I would like to start off with, you know, when we're in in-person worship, small groups of singers. And um, I do know this, considering the aerosols and how they travel, um, any number of singers in our choir loft would put our ministers at risk because I, if y'all know how First Dallas is, it's, the choir loft is right behind the dais. Um, and it's raked pretty significantly. I mean, I would feel okay about having a quartet, maybe a sextet, but more than that, I'm putting the ministers at risk. I mean, if somebody's sick, it, you know, but we don't know until we get testing, right? So um, we're blessed in that we have side balconies that we use from time to time. And so I, anybody bigger than probably, you know, six or eight max would go in, in a side balcony. Um, and I would think that would be later. As far as uh, getting the congregation in, um, how we're going to do that, uh, are we going to have singing, um, congregational singing? Um, <laughs> we haven't discussed it. So I just, I need to be honest about that. We're uh, being as robust as we can with our um, online presence um, and connections uh, via Zoom and um, via streaming and all of that. But I, anything I would say to you at this point would be purely speculation. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. No, Dana, that's great. And I know that we all live in different places. I mean, that literally, you know, where my dad serves, they haven't had a any cases of COVID in the county. Um, and so for them, you know, it kind of feels differently than getting together than those of us who live in the Metroplex. And that's why the bishop's kind of been articulating differently to us. I would like to ask anyone now on the panel who has had discussions with their congregations about what coming back looks like, if you would like to kind of share some of that creativity for everyone else to glean from, who would like to go? I, um, I'll follow up with what Dana said. We have not had any significant um, like policy discussion, I guess, is how I would couch it. Um, but we have talked about what would happen if we got back together, perhaps in July, uh, or as early as July, let me say it like that. Um, and if and when we do, what it means to have a spoken word service that scratches the itch for those people who desire to be present and together. Um, but recognizing um, that that doesn't include any music and then having on uh, at another time um, a more filled out liturgical service. So the spoken word thing um, would, I mean, we, we would advertise that and say, we, we want you to come, we desire for you to be here if you want to be here, but treating it basically like a very large Sunday school class and then um, still pre-recording these musical pieces that we do at a different time, in part because um, I think as Jason maybe was saying a minute ago, uh, the people that want to come back are in a pretty sufficient minority. And so how do you, how do you um, stay good to the people that are in the majority who want to worship online? Um, and I think the only way to achieve that is to um, to continue to do the, the stuff that we've actually gotten reasonably good at. So our, our immediate path forward, and I would say this will last, if I, if I had a guess, and uh, like Dana's saying, it's speculative, but um, I would guess that through the summer and probably approaching uh, Labor Day, just conservatively, we're going to be in this mode of doing a spoken word service for the live folks and an online service for those people who... Um, who need that music experience. And uh, if it lasts past that, then fine. Uh, and if it if we can figure out a way before then, also good. Um, but I think we're probably talking about two different church services for the time being. So Taylor, just for clarity, don't go away from me, brother. Um, and that is, um, 
when you say spoken word, so everyone understands, you're talking about a service in which there is no congregational singing of any kind, that it's really just a word that's projected from one person, probably not even any corporate praying or saying an affirmation of faith by a congregation. Yeah, I realize now that um, spoken word service sounds like a rat battle or something. <laughs> it's not that. Um, uh, yes, so uh, a chance to be together, um, not in any kind of like prayers of the people, but prayer time, uh, maybe affirmations, call to worship. Um, I can see those things going well, uh, a chance for the sermon to be delivered live. Maybe there's a way to have a, a Q&A session like uh, in a, a large Sunday school class. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the parameters of that. I'm, I'm, what I'm more sure of is the parameters of not involving any music and not putting those people at risk. Because then, of course, somebody says, well, why can't we have a soloist? Well, I guess we could, but are we saying to the soloist, then you will unmask yourself while literally everybody else in the facility is masked. And that doesn't feel like being a good steward uh, at all. So uh, I think we are truly talking about anything that could be spoken in a service and then anything that could be spoken and the music to go along with that spoken word in another service. Did I answer your question, Tim? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Taylor, you raised a couple issues, and I would like to kind of lift up an issue and see if anyone would like to deal with this one directly. Let's deal with the topic of mask. Taylor, you alluded that singing with a mask, that's been coming up in the chat room, is um, not easily done. Is there anyone that would like to speak to that and to whether or not you have musicians that will be masked or not? No one wants to tackle that one? Okay. I personally, Tim, would rather stay online and robust online than to come uh, ask any singer to be masked. I just, I don't even know. I no, uh, that's not. I don't. I don't see that as a very natural thing. I don't see that as a very effective thing. I see it as an enormous uh, inhibitor, both just technically and then it's just so awkward looking that I can't see um, that that would be very uplifting. So no, that's not happening in our our spot. I would rather remove them. Put them in the rear balcony if I have to, you know. Right. Uh, but, but no masks. Cool. I'm Dana, I have a question for you. So if you're putting your singers in the rear balcony and side balconies, how do you make that accessible for uh, TV recording? We have cameras in the balcony. Okay. And your sound, you you're able to get it all over the when um, you have singers ten feet apart and in every place in the building, you're able to use sound effectively that way? Yes. Okay. But how does putting that in the side balconies and the rear balconies solve the aerosol problem? Because the studies show that it hangs in the air for a considerable amount of time, regardless of where those people are in the building. Yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying. Um, it's also, spread is also, number of singers over an amount of time in a, cons in a confined space. So if I have um, four to eight singers spaced fairly widely um, in a side balcony that's probably 40 feet, eh, no, probably closer to 30 feet above any worshiper, and it's one song that's maybe a maximum of three minutes, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Now, others may not be, but I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with that. Um, but having said that, we haven't done it. <laughs> right. And and so with our soft opening. We're, we're online, so yeah. I'm sorry. With our soft opening on June 7th, our singers, everyone in the chancel, any singing uh, and all the pastors will be masked except when they are speaking or except when they are uh, singing. The congregation, any congregation that deems to come will be masked the entire time. Yeah. 
So I think with all of this speculation, I appreciate that we're all stepping into the realm of what if, and so no one's holding anybody's feet to the fire. No one's going to quote anybody out there. And um, so thank you for your vulnerability about how you're considering the future. I know one of the things that uh, we are considering, and that is um, how much can we clean if we have two services. And if we had one service at 8.30 with an hour and a half before and 11 o'clock in between, can we satisfactorily clean? Because we're considering that the people who very much want to be around others with face masks, that one service would be a required face mask service. And then all of those who um, don't feel like that really lives into who and how they want to contribute in the world, I see it when I walk in Kroger, the number of people who don't wear masks, that we would have potentially have a later service that would be um, masks are encouraged. Um, it's just a way to kind of figure out how to deal with it. I know everybody's trying to figure out that as well. Uh, I know, and I'm going to make a guess, that most of you, when it comes out, you're going to remove the things that people would touch. Um, in common, for example, we've already taken out our hymnals and our Bibles, and we're not going to be passing the plate anymore. We're already putting boxes in the back to take offerings. Um, we're leaving doors open when people come in so that people aren't touching door handles. We have people that are going to walk around with um, the various sprays and clean and wipe down services. I guess that I'm saying things similar to you all that we're not going to be when we open up starting with children and or youth programs. We're not going to be putting kids in those kinds of spaces. That some kind of coming back will be um, incremental and we'll kind of figure out as we grow. Um, Taylor, you were the one who alluded to us that, you know, that whole thing about taking registrations. Um, I would like to know if anyone else in, in the panel has any advice about what you are considering about how it may open up in a soft capacity or in increments? Do you have any more advice about what your churches are preparing for as we spread the wealth of creativity? I will just add, uh, as we were talking about, um, of course, pre-registration, uh, we also were trying to think of sort of a variety of built-in ways maybe that we could control capacity. For example, starting with small Sunday school classes, creating um, perhaps uh, some type of schedule whereby when we do begin to start doing soft reopening in small numbers, we have a Sunday when certain Sunday school classes can, uh, can come to have Sunday school class and then attend live worship. Um, and we create a schedule that way because those are just already kind of built in small group rosters within the life of the church. Um, so that is, that's one thing that we're possibility that we're exploring. We have had, we had a couple of people also on our survey suggest, um, it was definitely more than a few who suggested that we set up closed uh, circuit uh, televisions um, in Sunday school rooms around the church where they could watch the uh, recorded or they could watch live stream worship from the sanctuary, which sort of led us to wonder I mean, I think it, that's just an, perhaps an expression of how much people want to be in community with each other, because we're thinking, why is that any different from watching it from the comfort of your living room? Um, but uh, at the same time, um, we're not sure. Uh, we're, I mean, we've, we've been batting that around, but there have been people who have um, expressed a, a desire for us to at least explore that. The one part of it, of course, is we've been doing pre-recorded worship in installments, and so we're wondering if they really want to see what it's like, which is we are trying to record something with three takes or four takes and we stop and we redo it again. Um, if they really want to be a live studio audience or if they want to see the thing from start to finish. Um, but those are some of the things we've been talking about. Thank you, Jason. And my apologies to both you and Taylor, because it was you that brought up um, coming out, you know, in terms of registration and not Taylor and I'm just old and I forgot. Um, so sorry about that, brother. Um, I would like to lift up a few things that I have been learning about how people may consider coming back together. Um, having people register has been one, but another opportunity that I think Custer Road is looking at is how do you invite a small group of people to come and to be in a space and that it doesn't feel so much like and we're excluding others, but that's pretty much the gist of it. How do we keep out the people that might be most vulnerable? And for example, on the weekend when we would have had VBS, we're considering asking or inviting um, when we open up that only the families with children would come 
and they would come claim a pew, and every other pew is six feet across, and the children and families would come in, and there would be, again, no congregational singing, but we would play VBS songs, the kids would dance, and we would have a service that would be geared towards children, and hopefully keep out a population that is a little bit more vulnerable, realizing, of course, that children are vulnerable. Another Sunday we're considering is the youth who would not be going on mission trip, have just youth and their families come in, a youth family grabs a pew, and then invite a specific group saying, you guys are missing out on opportunity, we want you to come into this space. Uh, another, a third proposal is to have people who are um, first responders and or military families um, come in just to acknowledge, you know, that they provide something special in terms of our community at this time, um, police and everything that's going on as well as um, fire and hospitals to invite a specific um, demographic of people as a way of saying thank you, but it helps us test the waters and keep limited people in the space. The last idea that we're working with is um, something that I'm calling a progressive dinner um, type thing, and as weird as that is, but having people get um, up and when it's time for worship, they get in their cars and they go to some place that has green space, and there is a prayer that's led there for their and their families about creation. Um, it could be a park, it could be a creek, and then the second location is there to drive to um, some kind of drop-off. This is a Sunday morning activity. Um, any parking lot where they can give away clothes or shoes or items anywhere or food. The third location is go to a hospital parking lot and there will be a set of prayers um, and a song that will be for the people that are serving within that capacity. The last place is they will go, um, this could all be done on their phone, and they will go and listen to a message um, by the pastor while they sit at Sonic or at a donut shop. And then the soft opening is, and then anybody can come in at that time and can come in and find a spot and a clergy will have a prayer with just them and their family in the sanctuary. And that's the way to spread out the timing of the way that people would enter. Maybe they would never even sit down, but it's a soft way to kind of get people in the door and not be exclusive. Each one kind of having a progressive way of how do we include, and then once we do include anyone who wants to come, then it's also limiting the time and the spaces that they are in. Of course, we're considering not opening up our whole building uh, for cleaning purposes, but um, you know, I think Jason, as you remembered, you know, mentioned Sunday school classes and their desire to get together. Uh, we are taking our largest rooms, I'm sure like everyone else is, and trying to figure out, all right, now what's six feet of cross and how big is a Bible study can we manage in that space? And then that's it. Um, and then that will be kind of opening, will open up to those kind of groups as we come around. Now that's way beyond um, our goal here today in terms of music in particular. But I felt like that maybe if we just touch base with the conversations that are happening among our congregations on how we might open, that that might help everyone's creativity. All right, I have been looking some over here to the side um, and looking at you know the chat and so I want a, a minute to kind of look over that and also to come to um, our administrator to see if there's something she would like to bring to our attention but I would like to open this up now to anyone on the panel that you would like to offer either your own question your own creativity or your own thoughts about it I just like to open it all up um, any one of you go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, share I'll jump in. Um, I, I think we're probably all thinking um, in terms of what the next few months hold, recognizing that soon enough we would all start the process of, uh, uh, like Dana said, a, a lessons and carols service. Um, those things are not, we know that those things are not one off. They don't just happen in a vacuum. It takes months of preparation. Um, and it, I have I have gone down the road of of thinking you know what if we do A and then what if we do B and then just sort of saying to myself I can't I can't allow that thought process so I've replaced that thought process with a few just random ideas that um, and this is from this list that I created previously um, but here's just a few of them um, I've thought about having a commissioning uh, uh, competition uh, and putting it out there for uh, writers, young writers, and putting some serious limitations on what that means. So uh, maybe writers under the age of 25 
um, having a, a prize, maybe asking a, a choir member to help underwrite that or a few choir members to underwrite that, but uh, essentially um, having something for when we are able to get back together and having it be a piece of art that's created specifically for this time uh, and recognizing that for this time doesn't necessarily mean uh, social distancing, but at present it also means um, the social justice stuff that's all around us. Um, so I've, I've thought about doing that. I've thought about having a hymn writing um, contest, not even a contest, just submissions uh, within the congregation laying out. We, we've had these moments in, wor in worship services in the past where we've talked about what the meter of a poem is and how we can set those things to music relatively easily if we line out where we breathe. And so uh, opening that up so that everybody is setting the same standard meter or um, you know, everybody, we, we choose a hymn tune and then everybody writes to that uh, and having those things submitted. And either we create this cool uh, way to sing new hymns that are written by our people for this time, or we um, mesh all those things together and we create sort of like a, a super hymn for the moment. Uh, so I've thought about that. Um, and then just flat out commissioning perhaps a, a piece of music for this time. I will say uh, as a writer and on behalf of writers, the, the unnerving thing is not even that um, people aren't buying music right now, but what the ramifications are for not buying music and what happens when whole editorial staffs are laid off at your favorite publisher. Um, so um, engaging in these uh, opportunities that are maybe a little bit outside the box and giving your people some claim in that. Um, I mean, even with the idea of having a uh, com competition where maybe the, the, the prize for a writer under the age of 25 is a thousand dollars or something like that. How cool would it be if you have a youth choir to get them engaged and let them be a part of the, the voting for such a thing? Give, give, giving every uh, um, choir a chance to engage in some way I think is super important right now and, and preventing us from having to answer questions like, well, what are we doing for Christmas or what does it mean for uh, X, um, because because I don't know the answer, here is a new answer, we're gonna have a contest. Um, so I would just encourage folks to start thinking about some things that we can do, rather than uh, lulling um, ourselves with the things that, that we can't, and that we have no business answering right now. And, and that is the absolute truth. We just simply don't have any business making claims about what the future holds, because we don't, we don't know enough. <laughs> Thank you, Taylor. Karen, I know your dog has something to say. Do you want to say something too? Karen, you're muted. Or maybe your dog muted it. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to mute for you. You wouldn't hear my dog. Um, one thing that we've created is a Google Drive doc that our worship team and staff, we just dump outrageous, preposterous, creative, you know, ideas into no matter how wacky and we just keep track of that. And like you guys, we are watching what other churches are doing, other denominations are doing. Today, I went to First Baptist Church, Louisville. They had a drive up worship service. Their band was on the roof and, and uh, it was so cool. And we were in our cars and tuned to a radio station. I mean, just really trying to think outside the box. Now that's something that I don't wanna do in August. You know, it's a hundred degrees. Uh, but it, it was really interesting. And so trying to, you know, know that whatever we do, and we are talking about coming back together in June or uh, the first week of July, we have a whole task force and we did the survey and all of that as well. So um, we're just, what can we do to fill those, those spaces that would have been for congregational singing and, you know, just popcorning all kinds of ideas, some crazy, and I'm sure we'll try most of them or a lot of them. Um, anything that will help us honor God and worship fully using our, our, our whole being, because we're just worried of standing and just talking um, in the space will, um, I don't know, n not be as... Um, we're worried about the, the level of energy and keeping that keeping that going. So we're having a lot of conversations when we are back. What will our the energy of our worship be? Thank you, Karen. 
Does anyone else on the, on the panel have something to suggest? So Karen, over here in the, in the chat, there has been some discussion of outside services. And of course you raised a, a Baptist one that is unique and wonderful. Um, but I also would like to lift up that I guess what we've learned is that airflow is important in terms of like um, the air that can come an, around us and help distribute the aerosol and get it away. So, so therefore outdoor um, is a much better option in terms of disbursement from what I'm understanding and what I have been reading. So for those of you in which an outdoor service is possible, um, I think that is something definitely to consider. I know that people have been doing everything from drive up communion to who knows what to kind of um, have a community and yet not be together. I also would like to now um, jump to another topic. And um, this would be the last one that I think that we'll lift up today. And I would like for some creativity for smaller churches um, about what a smaller church might do somewhere um, that doesn't have the reinforcements in terms of tech and or even in terms of sizes of choirs, um, what they may or may not do or what they're going to say to their people, let alone um, about congregational singing. So if I am to make an assumption, um, I think that it is fair to say that um, we have heard from ACDA and, um, and Nats in terms of concluding with them that um, there is something about singing, in particular vowels, which does produce an aerosol which travels farther than the spoken word, which tends to fall within six feet. And this singing is a particular issue, and a congregation of singing people is something that we need to be careful of, and we need to protect our people from that. Um, I don't think this would be a big deal if the people who were sick knew they were sick. It is the ones who come in who don't know that they carry the virus and then find out, oops, two days later, and then we have entire congregations that are affected. And none of us want to be, you know, that congregation. None of us want to be on the news and none of us want to visit <laughs> or not visit people in the hospital because of it. So we do have responsibility. So how can we um, inspire and, and how can we have a sense of community and not sing together as a group? Um, and I think the text of our hymns are still profound and they still can be spoken like poetry and they can still be lifted inside of you know our hearts. And I think no matter how big our church is, we do have the ability to play a recording of some hymn that might um, apply and can be in our spaces and can allow people's hearts to soar. I don't want us to think or to get the thing that we're now cutting out everything that we are, for me as a person who has invested my whole life in terms of congregational song, um, there are still new and creative avenues to participate that and to offer it to our people. And we just have to figure out what that is in our context. I think I'm also making an assumption that when some kind of vaccine comes around, you know, that we will have a new day and new opportunities. I myself am wondering, will things ever look the same as I remember them a year ago? Um, what will it be like when we gather? I think we're all certainly going to be more involved in technology. Um, and I think we're going to still be looking for creative ways to get together and to worship. I just want to, in this time of, oh my goodness, we can't, to have a time together of, so what can? What can we do? We all have limitations. We all have budgets to consider. Um, we all are bound by something. Um, but yet we are also freed by something. And that is to keep articulating, you know, the love of Jesus Christ in some unique and creative way. I know that we have pressure from outside forces, people on our staffs or people in our churches who should, um, who feel strongly about the way it should be or this way or that way. And, I just want to be empathetic with you and your environment and in your church home that, um, my goodness, you are the one. You're the one who has been called for this task and this assignment of leading your people in this COVID time and continue to inspire on them. So um, I want all of you to um, feel empowered and energized and more than anything, to feel inspired by the people and the faces you see around you. We have had up to about 92 of us or so well, there's one heck of a lot of good thinking going around just on the screens right here. And you have heard from um, eight of the voices in the Metroplex and beyond. Call on them. 
um, and check in with Dana and see how she's doing this crazy thing, you know, where she's challenging her people and, and, and check in, you know, with people who are doing virtual things like Manya. And I'm sure I'll speak for you, Sister Mar Manya, that they'll help you out and will help you get started and will help you think of creative ways that you can keep living in the ministry. We are here to support and encourage and to be with one another. So with that in mind, um, I would like to end with another prayer as we started, but I want to just take a step back and see if anyone has anything um, that they would like to lift up at this time. I see a lot of good advice. I hope you're looking in the chat about University Park and everything else, but um, anyone else have something for the good of us all? I just put in the chat my email address, and if I could be a helpful, creative, unbiased uh, thinker with you, I'm, I'd be happy to sit on a Zoom call like this. Um, I, I think one of the things that um, probably an outside voice can give is just a sense of clarity and, and bouncing random ideas off of them uh, certainly doesn't hurt. So um, use me if you'd like. I'd, I'd be happy to... Uh, in any way. Thank you very much. I see Manya has contributed yours, and um, I think, of course, that is why I am here, and as well as others, to help out in any way that we can. Please feel free to um, contact us and allow us to uh, to encourage one another. Does anybody have anything else? Yes, I would just like to say thank you, Tim, for gathering us here together. And I'd like to thank, um, just glad to see everyone and just know that we have a family here and a community here. So please, I uh, say, let's stay in touch. Uh, and I pray God's blessings upon each of you and on your ministries. Thank you very much, Manya. I appreciate that word. Anything else? Okay. Let us close with this word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for this time together. It is an amazing thing to gather in this kind of form format, dear Lord. But I know this. You have blessed each and every one of us on this. You have touched our hearts. And there was some point that music lifted us up and it communicated with you in a way that the spoken word never did. Thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings. Now, dear Lord, with the challenges that set before us, give us wisdom and strength. And give us courage, dear Lord, to speak into the places that are difficult. And dear Lord, with the power of your Holy Spirit, guide us and direct us. For you have called us to guide and direct a flock of people who look to us to protect them and to inspire them. So use us to our fullest potential to be your witness in this time throughout COVID-19, to be a witness of your love and grace to all who will hear. We give you thanks for the opportunity to serve you to sing for you, and to be blessed by you. We give our lives and our service. In Jesus' name, amen. My thanks to everyone, including uh, Tracy, who's kept us all going. God bless. Let's remain in contact, and thank you all very much. I do believe that Tracy has recorded this. If you have anyone that you feel like needs to be hearing bits and pieces of this, I appreciate the 90 minutes that you've given. Take care. God bless. Goodbye, everyone.